Your Royal Highness, the events marking the 50th anniversary of VE Day have tended to overshadow the fact that uh, the war wasn't yet over. Uh, Japan actually didn't surrender until August the 14th, 1945. Can you recall the events of that day? Um, 14th. Uh, well, I can recall being in Guam uh, with uh, two, I was in, in a destroyer at Welp, and there was another one, Wager, and we were escorting the Commander-in-Chief, Sir Bruce Fraser, on a visit to Admiral Nimitz, who was the Commander-in-Chief South, uh, South Pacific area. And uh, he was, he, the, uh, Sir Bruce was going to give him the, the night, make him a knight of the, of the, of the bath. And while we were there, the first of the atomic bombs was dropped, and that was about the 6th, I think, of October, uh, 6th of August. And almost immediately, we sailed from Guam to rejoin the big American fleet off Japan, of which the British Pacific Fleet formed one task group out of six, I think. And uh, we hung about there until the second bomb was dropped, and then we, it was announced that the Japanese decided to cease hostilities. They didn't actually surrender on the, whatever it is, the, what did you say, so, 12th? The 14th of 14th, August. Right. Yeah. And then <clears throat> a um, small party was formed of the, commander, of the fleet commander, it was Admiral Halsey, and Sir Bruce Fraser, and Duke of York. The fleet, uh, Halsey was in the Missouri. And he had four destroyers, and, and there were two of us. So it was this, this little party of six destroyers and two battleships went off to, to uh, uh, Japan. And uh, the next day, or whatever it was, we anchored in, the, uh, in the Sagami Bay, which was on, just on the outskirts. And we waited there, oh, for 24 hours. And then this party went up into Tokyo Bay. One of the extraordinary things that happened while we were in that bay waiting. I mean, it was quite, quite a dramatic uh, arrival. You know, you'd been, you'd spent years fighting the Japanese, you read someone, and suddenly we're in Japan. You know, it's most extraordinary. But we heard over the fleet sort of broadcast <clears throat> uh, the two Royal Marines had, had managed to escape, believe it or not, from a prisoner of war camp in Japan. And you wonder what on earth they were doing. I suppose they heard the bombs go off and they thought, well, this is the time to move. And they got down to, the, to this bay, and they saw this fleet of ships with Stars and Stripes and, and, uh, and Union Jacks. So they said, well, these must be friends. So they stripped their clothes off and swam out, because they were intercepted by uh, you know, patrol boats and taken on board the flagship. And everybody thought this was a great occasion. Anyway, about 30 years later, I was attending uh, uh, the annual conference, or the annual reunion of the Far East prisoners of war. And I thought I'd tell this story to the assembled company. In the middle of this thing, they said, they're here. <laughs> and, the, and the two blokes who were actually attending that thing. <laughs> it was extraordinary. extraordinary. But what sort of celebrations took place on HMS Welp? Well, there, there weren't any. None well, of what, we, we, No, we, it was quite busy because we went on up into the bay. And then uh, there, was, there was quite a lot to do, funnily enough. I don't know why. And then, of course, on the 3rd of September, they, everybody gathered. We had to wait for two or three days, well, until then, uh, because there was a, um, a typhoon and uh, General Marshall couldn't get to Tokyo and a lot of the representatives couldn't get there. And that you, was actually, well, sorry, you mentioned that the, the two bombs had already been dropped on Japan at Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. Do you think it actually took that to make the Japanese surrender, or do you think eventually they would have surrendered anyway? Well, I think they would have surrendered anyway, but I mean, a lot later, because even after the two bombs went off, <clears throat> if you read the, the account, you'll find that the, uh, there was n no agreement about the imperial in the cabinet or the imperial council, and it was only when the emperor virtually ordered them all to shut up and to accept the surrender, and the terms that had been published at Potsdam. No, but th th there was one other quite amusing incident that happened on the way uh, up to, to Tokyo or to the, um, the other wager. The, the, the RNVR doctor was a, was a Canadian. And the captain of the wager was a very jolly fellow called Basher Watkins. Thought he'd play a little practical joke on him. And so he wrote out a signal which, from the Commander-in-Chief saying, report name, rank, and seniority of the senior Canadian officer born, you see. And he sent it down to the, to the, to the doctor, who came rushing up with the, what is this? 
well, he said, I expect it's they want somebody to sign for Canada, and you're, they, there aren't anybody here, so they, they probably chose, I imagine that's what it's for. And eventually, after they, they all had a great laugh, and uh, uh, so it was all over. To the, to the captain's horror, about an hour later, a signal arrived from the Duke of York saying, report name, rank, and seniority of senior Canadian officer born. <laughs> and of course, he didn't know what to do. So he, the first thing he did was he sent for this ship's Bible, and then he sent, sent for the doctor. And he put his hand on the Bible, he showed him the signal, he said, I swear this is true. <laughs> <laughs> and then unfortunately, uh, well, for him, a, a Canadian uh, senior, a more senior Canadian officer appeared. But this Canadian doctor, in spite of that, was invited over to, to, the KG, to the Missouri to witness the surrender. And he thought he'd better bring back something to, for the, or from the occasion. So he picked up one of those expended flashlight bulbs, uh, which was then mounted by the ship's carpenter in a little thing, and it stood on the mantelpiece. And <laughs> well, that was the Allied the Supreme Commander was General MacArthur, of course. Yeah. Mm. Um, he accepted the Japanese surrender on the on the twenty second on the on the second of September, mm. uh, on the Missouri. What what can you actually recall of that particular day? <laughs> we were painting ship. You were painting. Mm. You but, not you yourself, yeah, I hope. Well, not quite. But I mean, I was organising it because we'd been at sea for quite a long time. We thought we'd better look a bit smarter, and uh, there wasn't anything going on that day, so we had everybody and I. We have these sound reproduction equipment, uh, you know, they were loudspeakers. Yes. And so we had them picking up the, the commentary on the thing, and I hung them over the side so the sailors that were slapping the paint on could listen to what was going on. They could paint in time to the music, perhaps? Well, if there wasn't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, you'd come a long way from your days as a, as a prize-winning uh, cadet at uh, Dartmouth College. It sounds as if I'd been to the Royal Show. And <laughs> no, I know that your, your grandfathers were both sailors. Your father was a soldier. Um, but I believe you yourself really would have preferred to have joined the Air Force originally. So wh why did you end oh, up joining I the Navy? I preferred. It, uh, I don't know, at that time it seemed to be, I mean, I'd just come out of school, so I, I did not preferred. No, I mean, I think that if I'd left to my own devices, I think I probably would have signed up for the Navy. But I was eventually persuaded by my uncle, Lord Mountbatten, <coughs> that it might be more sensible to go into the, into the Navy. Did you have any regrets about joining the Navy rather than the Air Force? Only in so far that if I joined the Air Force, I wouldn't be here now. <laughs> Not in, if I joined in 1939. You would have been, no, I would have been the bomb. pushing up the daisies. Oh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Now, your old schoolmaster and the founder of Gordonston, Court Hahn, uh, wrote in your report, and I quote here, Prince <laughs> Philip will make his mark in any profession uh, where he'll have to prove himself in a full trial of strength. Was there any doubt in your mind that you would pursue a military career? Oh yes, I mean it never occurred to me that I was, it was only because the war broke out that, that I, it seemed to be easier to join than, than be called up. And uh, so it was inevitable that I, that, that, I mean I, I think I, I, it was inevitable that I was going to be in one of the services during the war. I mean people of that age, we, we just did. But I mean before that it, didn't, it hadn't really occurred to me. I had vaguely thought of what could I do, a bit difficult being stateless. What sort of aspirations did you have? Oh, I don't know, farmer or something, I suppose. A, a farmer? <laughs> well, I don't know. I really <laughs> have to wait and see. So your first ship was HMS Ramillies. That's it, uh, what, what do you remember about that ship? It yeah, was the first I, time I you really her, went I to sea. I joined her in Colombo, and it was very hot, I seem to remember. We lived in fairly Spartan conditions. We had a, the Mitchman lived in what was called a chest flat, which was a, a hole uh, in the, uh, right down. It had no outside scuttles or anything. And there was no air conditioning and no sort of, and we had a bathroom and just a, a, a space where we kept those chests, you know, sea chests, with our kit in it. It was so hot down there, we didn't sleep down there. We had uh, camp beds on the upper deck. The, the um, um, funnily enough, I'd met, uh, I'd met the chap who'd been the schoolmaster in, in Ramillies and it, and it, the other day. Were you treated as one of the boys? Well, I was, yes. There weren't yes. any girls in those days. No, no, but I think you know what I mean. I mean, you were, after all, a prince. Uh, yeah, didn't, didn't, didn't. Being plunged amongst midshipmen. No, no, no. no, no. The, the, um, the, but the Navy was quite used to sort of curious people like her. There wasn't, uh, nobody stood on ceremony no, or... No, no, Now, for the whole of 1940... Actually, funnily enough, the captain of, of uh, Ramley was a fellow called Bailey Groman. 
and he made me what was called his doggy, which was a, a sort of Mitchman assistant. And he did it because he'd been my grandfather's doggy. <laughs> so he must have had some stories to tell. Well, I don't know, he's long since. Yeah. But for the whole of 1940, you, you were kept away from the heavy action. Did you accept that as a prince from a neutral country that, that there was no option? Well, it didn't bother me very much because the, the ships that I was serving in were right there anyway. I mean, somebody had to serve in them. So, I mean, uh, it, it, no, it just so happened that I was perfectly content. Um, I would have gone up, I suppose. I was, yes, I was moved out of, moved out of Ramleys when she went to the Mediterranean. I was moved out of Kent when she went to the Mediterranean. And then I was, went to Shropshire. And then when the Italians invaded Greece, then they, they sort of lifted the ban and I was sent to join Valiant in Alexandria. What kind of ship was Valiant? Well, she was another First World War battleship, but she'd been, she'd been through a major refit just before the war. And she, instead of having six inch batteries, sort of, she had 4.5 inch turrets, which acted as anti-aircraft turrets. So they, were, they had six of these on each, uh, three of these on each side. She was in the Battle of Jutland, I think. Well, so what do you remember about her? Well, I mean, quite a lot, I suppose, because we had uh, six quite uh, active months in... Uh, I mean, within two or three days of joining, we went out and um, there was a great bombardment of the, of the Italian-held um, uh, port of Bardia in North, North, uh, in North Africa. And it was quite impressive, uh, a lot of 15-inch guns going off, which I hadn't heard before. And the whole... I mean, it made even big ships like that rock about a bit. And then the Italians had the effrontery to shoot back. So it's quite interesting to hear these things whistling over and landing in the water with a great splash beside you. You suddenly realize that life was for real. And you, you were frightened, obviously. No, it was, it was, it was, it was you know, you, I don't know, what, uh, frightened. It was just surprising. Do you have time to think about fright when a, in a situation like that? N no, not directly. I, I, was, I was more frightened on other occasions. But and then very soon after that, we, we were with the, uh, taking a convoy to Malta, and there was a tremendous attack on the whole fleet by uh, German um, dive bombers, the Stukas. And they, we, I was watching, I was actually in one of the turrets, but I managed to get my head up through the, one of the 15-inch turrets. It wasn't doing much good in an air raid. <laughs> I managed to stick my head out and watched the bombers attacking these things, attacking the illustrious, the carrier, and they did quite a lot of damage, and then she had to be taken out to the Mediterranean. There was, there was, then that was quite, but there was so much going on, and there was so much shooting, and so many, everybody was rushing about, and noises everywhere. It wasn't a question of fright, it was just you know, amazement that anything like this could actually happen. Your role as searchlight operator in the Battle of uh, Cape no. Matapan earned you a mention in dispatches. Uh, what can you remember of the battle itself? Well, it, it was a very long, drawn-out affair until we actually got to the point. Uh, and the, 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 the battalions were chased and attacked by swordfish and torpedo bombers, and then they were attacked by the um, cruisers, and then they turned around and attacked the cruisers. And the, so all this was going on for days. And, and one of the Italian, I think it was the Polo, was, uh, was damaged and stopped. And um, t two of her, two other cruisers came back to her assistance during the night. But unfortunately for them, they were detected. And, and so the, the uh, battle fleet, which was Queen Elizabeth Valiant and, I can't remember the other one was, Barham, and the, the carrier uh, Courageous? I, no, it wasn't. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, oh, anyway, um, we plowed on to, to where we thought these, these uh, um, cruisers were going to be. And Valiant actually had a rather rudimentary radar and picked up these, these um, echoes, which, which were stationary. And so we assumed that's who they were. But I got an indication what direction to, to point the, the searchlights. And they said, well, illuminate. So I switched the things on. And I suppose <laughs> she had a good chance. I actually found a cruiser. Are you sure you're not being modest now? Well, there was not much else to do. The, it, was, it was a very strange sensation because it's pitch dark. You suddenly turn on these enormous searchlights, huge sort of things. You see this beam shooting out. It's a very calm night. And, and it picked up. We were so close. I mean, we can't have been more than about 2,000 yards or something. And the beam wasn't big enough to, to cover the whole cruiser. Really. And so somebody said, train right or something. Because, and there was another cruiser. And so, 
And with that, everybody started shooting, whereupon they didn't really need <laughs> much illumination after that. Soon after the fall of, of, of Greece in April 1941, uh, Valiant was in action again at the Battle of Crete. Uh, this time, the Luftwaffe had, had a real field day. Can you tell me what happened? Well, uh, it was part of the, I suppose, people were trying to evacuate the, the uh, British troops from, from Crete, the last ones to come out. So we weren't particularly involved in that. I mean, we were milling around some distance, or you could see Crete, but some distance away. And there was general sort of usual confusion. Everybody was shooting and airplanes were flying about. And uh, we, were, we were, I think it, it was then, or, or no, I think it was the, the day after Matapan that we were hit by uh, two bombs, one forward and one aft. How close in succession? Well, it was one stick of bombs, that, and they went sort of diagonally across the ship, and one hit <clears throat> on the quarter deck, and the other one just missed the, the forehead. But it, the, the whole ship bent like that with the explosions, and, and actually bent sufficiently for some of the hatches down below to be jammed. So several people rang up and said, please, can you get a tin opener? We'd like to get out, you know. Um, but everybody was, I mean, it was, you know, usually people, airplanes flying around, people shooting, everybody shouting, clouds of smoke. And, and <laughs> so panic as well? No, 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 it was, it was, uh, no, it was all fairly controlled, but anti-aircraft fire wasn't highly accurate. And um, there was so much flying about that uh, you, it was difficult to follow what was going on. And we, um, I, most all the damage was done to cruisers and destroyers, really. We, we didn't, either the, we were lucky, I think, really, to escape. But how badly did it uh, actually damage the ship? I mean, did you have oh, to... Oh, no, the, <coughs> at Crete, we weren't damaged at all. It, that, this happened the morning after at Matapan. Yes, but when these bombs hit, did it really disable the vessel vastly? No, no, absolutely not. No, it made, made no difference at all. Only one chap was killed, and he was extremely unlucky. I mean, a, a big box was blown off a bulkhead and, and just hit him. Is, is it possible to recall uh, any of the, of the emotions that were felt uh, when you were under attack? <laughs> no. Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, you, you, there's so much to do, you know. You, you're, you're so occupied that you, you, and, and everybody knows what they're doing. It's very difficult. You can't sort of sit back and say, well, I, what do I feel like today, you know? No, no, no. I know it's a favorite question of everybody. What does it feel like to do this? What does it feel like to do that? But I mean, can't... what does it feel like to do this? <laughs> well, I don't know. I wonder whether I'll be asked in many, many years' time. <laughs> you can't actually train for this, though, can you? Oh, yes, you could do, yes. In fact, there's an awful lot of simulated training goes on, uh, particularly now. And, and the simula there were simulators during the war. So if you went into a, the anti-aircraft school, for instance, we had all the noises and all the sort of... So you got used to it. Your uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten, lost his ship, mm, uh, yeah. HMS Kelly, in the Battle of Crete. Uh, was that a major blow for the Navy's morale? Well, there were an awful lot of ships were lost. I mean, yes, he wasn't the only one. But, but, but particularly with Lord Louis on board, high oh, profile. No I, don't think, I don't, no, I don't think so. I don't... I think uh, if anybody was lost, it was... Uh, but it, 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 there was a completely different atmosphere in those days because people accepted that sort of loss. It, it, was, it was part of the fortunes of war. I mean, we didn't, we didn't all have councillors rushing around every time let somebody let off a gun, you know. Said, oh, are you all right? Are you sure you haven't got some ghastly phobia or anything? He just got on with it. He, I saw him when he came back to, to uh, Alexandria because he was picked up. And uh, he, he um, I always remember, because he'd, he'd been swimming about for quite a long time in, in water, with, so his eyes were, were sort of bright orange, well, sort of, uh, uh, not orange, uh, sort of Red with the salt. Colored. No, 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 from the oil in the water. But uh, everybody got back to work again very quickly. Did being involved in, in the battles of uh, Matapan and Crete change your outlook on life? I mean, young men are notorious for thinking, oh, well, it'll never happen to me. But in fact, it did happen to you. No. no I mean, it, I think we all took it as being part of the <laughs> business. That we all were doing fighting if you weren't going to fight. Coming through any kind of military action must galvanize spirits, though. I mean, um, were there great feelings of camaraderie with, with, with the tension 
perhaps waiting for the next encounter? Uh, it's terribly difficult to know. I mean, once you are in the, the, the routine, you're always going out on some operation, coming in again. And I think the, the having followed the, 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 the events that led up to Mattapan before we went to sea, um, knowing that we were going to get involved or hoping to get involved, was a, you know, people said, well, I don't want to be a hero, you know, <laughs> but it was all, it was all rather sort of childish, but I mean, people just got on with it. And by the time you appear to have built up a reputation as a man of action who, who didn't really stand on ceremony, um, your journey home to the UK <laughs> by a coal-fired <laughs> ship, troop, troop, troop ship, for instance, uh, do you remember the Chinese stokers going on strike, on strike, jumping yeah. ship at, at uh, Puerto, Rico. Puerto Rico, yeah? What happened? They went on strike and left. <laughs> <laughs> and then they called her in. There weren't very many passengers on board, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> I think there were three RN Mitchellmen and one... Um, Merchant Navy apprentice. We'd, we'd managed to transship at Durban and, and we hoped to get home quicker. In fact, we, we didn't really, but we pulled in at uh, Puerto Rico to refuel. And so we, we were asked to volunteer. So we went down and did some coal trimming. I got a certificate from the, from the um, um, Canadian Pacific uh, saying that I'd qualified as a coal trimmer, but I've lost it, needless to say. Hard work? <laughs> Oh, it's quite hard work, yes. Lost a few pounds in weight now. I right? really like it, yeah. Why did they go on strike in the first place? I have place? no idea. I, can't, I, I wasn't paying much attention. We went, then went on to Newport News, and um, where I managed to, the three of us managed to hire a car and drive up to Washington, which is quite funny. We were in white uniforms and drove back through the pouring rain and had a flat tire just before we got to, to back to Newport News. And of course, trying to change a tire in the rain in white uniform left us looking pretty scruffy. <laughs> what did you do in Washington? I just walked around and had a look. And w when you were there, what was the, the American attitude towards you? British well, naval officers, I mean, there was no com covering it up, you were in uniform. Yes, but I think there were so many uniforms, and, and Washington's a very cosmopolitan place. I don't think anybody noticed, frankly. Mm. Well, in 1942, you joined HMS Wallace for convoy duty off the east coast of Britain. A very, very different role altogether, having been in action so much in the Mediterranean. Was this a bit of an anticlimax for you? Oh, Lord, no. I mean, the North, the, the North Sea was, was a very active place. E-Boat Alley, I think it was called. Yeah, well, that's for, off, the, off the Norfolk, Suffolk coast, yes. But we used to start with convoys uh, in the Firth of Forth at Methyl, and then take them down to Sheerness, and we'd spend a night in Sheerness, and then pick up another one and take it back again. But they only... They advanced at about six knots on average, and as the tide was five knots, it wasn't really, frankly, we didn't get anywhere very fast. And then at night, there were usually alarms about e-boat attacks, so we had to rush around and fire star shells. And we only, I, I don't think we, we really had a, a serious encounter with e-boats. I mean, I think I saw one the whole time I was there. Was it frustrating for you then, having been in so much action well, in the Mediterranean? Was quite it seemed a bit quiet. No, no, absolutely. No, not at all. No, no. I mean, we were much nearer. I don't forget, <laughs> that's very close to the French and German coast. They could, they, aircraft could fly out very easily and did. And there was bombing over, the, over this country. They came over the whole time. <clears throat> there were e-boats coming out. No, we, it was much more in the front line. Within a few months, you were promoted to first well, lieutenant. I was, no, I was, first of all, I was promoted to lieutenant because I joined as a sub-lieutenant. <clears throat> and then after I'd been a lieutenant for whatever it was, I don't know, about three or four months, the then first lieutenant left, and the captain was, was uh, left with really a choice of getting a new first lieutenant or m moving me up into the slot. So he decided to move me up into the slot and got a sub-lieutenant instead. So that was very good. Were you, uh, was this part of your desire? Were you very ambitious? No, I don't think so. I was, I, I was, I was quite surprised, I suppose. And pleased? Oh, yes. Now, there was some friendly rivalry with um, a young officer, an Australian, called uh, Mike Parker, later to become your equerry. Uh, how did this rivalry manifest itself? It didn't. <laughs> was he not on a, he was on a ship called Lauderdale, HMS Lauderdale? Was that oh, right? I didn't know him at that time. Right. <clears throat> I only met him in, 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 uh, in, in, the, um, in Australia when, when we were in the same flotilla. He was in... Uh, um, 
whirlwind. And I, was it whirlwind? And I was in Welp. We were in the same, the 27th flotilla. But I mean, we, we saw a lot of each other after that because uh, he was one of the ships that was in, in Hong Kong and we got to know each other and played squash. You know, that's why. Good mates. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I read that as a young naval officer, you were, you were pretty much a perfectionist. Is that the case? At what? <laughs> a stickler for perfection. I don't think so, not, not particularly. I mean, you know, I think everybody tried their best to make the best of the, of the job. We had, we had very good people. Some might see the Navy as a, as a rather solitary life for a, for a 21-year-old bachelor, uh, separated from his family, his friends by war and thousands of miles. How, how did you stay in touch with events back home? Well, by letter. <laughs> I don't know how else. <clears throat> um, Who did I, you write to? Or? Well, my grandmother, I suppose, most of the time. Because my mother was in, in Athens, my father was in Monte Carlo, my sisters were in Germany, and an aunt was in Sweden. And so, I mean, there, there wasn't a I Oh, well, I suppose in the, um, the late Duchess of Kent, who was a cousin of mine who lived here, and I suppose she was her, the nearest relation I had in this country, other than my grandmother, who I always go and stay with. And you got letters from the young Princess Elizabeth, too, I believe, perhaps at that time. Uh, yeah, sort of off and on. Hmm. Did they mean very much to you in those days? Well, yes. I mean, we were, everybody was glad to get a letter, yeah. You had been a guest uh, of the royal family at Windsor. Um, what, what kind of wartime leaders were the king and queen in those days? What were their great strengths that you had picked up and seen? Well, I only saw them off duty anyway. When they came down to Windsor for a weekend, that's as much as I ever did. I spent Christmas there once. So I never saw them in, in, in that light. I mean, they were, they were sort of hosts uh, on, on those occasions. And it was very much a sort of family party, and, and exactly as it might have been anywhere else. So I, I, I wasn't involved in the, what, I, what you like to call it, the official activities. And I, I never saw them functioning, as it were, in, in, in their um, specific, uh, or doing any of their particular duties. We've seen great archive material of them walking over ruins in the East End. and Oh, sure. Sort of but thing. I mean, I wasn't around. Well, yeah. I was, but I mean, not when they were there. I mean, I was not very far from here on leave from Recife, and I was actually having a bath rather comfortably in my uncle's flat in the top, well, little house he had in Chester Street. And I was lying there thinking, this is rather splendid, and wondering what I was going to do that evening, when a doodle bug went past the window, and, 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 it, and it landed just not very far away back there with a loud crump. Made you get out of the bath pretty quick and dry. Well, I reckon it was too late by then, so I just stayed in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the spring of 1944, your new ship, uh, HMS Welp, was being built in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. uh, you spent some time around the, the shipyard temper. waiting for the completion of work. Uh, well, was that duty very frustrating, <laughs> waiting for your ship? No, it wasn't at all frustrating. What you had to do, a ship, while it's being built, they send a certain number of people in advance, the, 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 the chief engineer and the first attempt, who's the executive officer, the administrative officer, on ahead to, in a sense, to supervise the, the, the final fitting out. And there are all sorts of little things. They say, where would you like this piece of kit? Where would you like that? And how would you like this arranged? And, and, and you had to, stores were coming in. You had to, so that the thing was a combination of work together with the builders, which was Hawthorne, Leslie, and Hepburn. And, uh, for the Navy, if you know what I mean, for all the sort of internal naval arrangements. Then you had to write things like standing orders and, and look and see who you were going to get. And then people drifted in all the time, so you had to accommodate them. And I mean, it was a sort of administrative business, simply getting the ship ready for, for um, commissioning. And you were living at that time in a boarding house? No, in a hotel. I think it was in called the Gordon Hotel, somewhere or other. I can't remember. What it was in. Sort of residential hotel. I think so, it is. Yeah which probably gave you the, the, an insight into the man in the street, as it were. The man in the street live in a hotel? Well, if you would like to put it that way. <laughs> I mean, we had lots of men in the street, off the street in the Navy. I mean, most of the ships, in, most of the men in Wallace came from Liverpool. And a lot of the ones in, in Welp came from uh, South Wales. But you don't understand, if, you, if, you serve, if you're in the services, you, you meet people from, from all walks of life. I mean, it's, it's, you just live with them, you know, it's not, all, the only difference is that people have different responsibilities. So you're glad that you were in the services then? 
Oh, yes. It gave you a, a greater insight, perhaps, to... Well, I didn't, I didn't do it with that end in view. But no, that, no. that is what you get at the end of it. You get to know people of, of every kind of background. Which you wouldn't necessarily have done. To, huh? Which you wouldn't necessarily have done had you not been in the services. Uh, yeah, hmm. you could say that. By now, Italy had surrendered. Uh, By when are we now? <laughs> D-Day was a couple of months away. Uh, from a military perspective, did you feel the tide had turned in the Allies' favour? Well, it obviously had, didn't it? I mean, we yes, were, it had. <laughs> we but landed. were you aware of it? Oh, yes, we knew exactly. We were in, uh, because we just commissioned, the whole of the 27th Fertilla, or most, yes, most of it except for one that had got damaged, all, were all up in Scarpa Flow. We were the only inhabitants of Scarpa Flow during the invasion because we were literally all just been commissioned. And as soon as the invasion had taken place, uh, the, the, and, and the war was moving into Europe. In fact, the, the naval war in, in, in Europe virtually ended. I mean, the, 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 the U-boats had more or less, well, they, they were still being chased, but I mean, in a sense, they were not as effective as they had been. Um, and and the, the, everybody's eyes, or at least our eyes, were on the Far East because the war was still going on. So we all set off and went through the Mediterranean and, and, and went to Ceylon, where the, the, the ships that were going to form the British Pacific Fleet joined together and then went out jointly to via Fremantle and, and round to Sydney. And, and, and a, a proportion of ships stayed in Trincomalee in the East Indies as the East Indies fleet, working with the, with the Burma, in a sense, as part of the Burma War. So what was the state of the Pacific War at this time? Well, the, it was... The sense, Allies had begun to get on top. It, oh, it was quite how, bloody. Well, the Allies, it weren't, it was the Americans, there weren't anybody else. And they would got on very severely on top. They were, they'd uh, retaken most of the islands which the Japanese had occupied at some stage during the war. They'd worked them right back. And by, when we arrived, they were just invading Okinawa. And uh, it, we only got in... Uh, to the, to the invasion of Iwo Jima. And, uh, but that was almost entirely an air war. I mean, it was the carriers fly, flying off um, aircraft for, for interdiction bombing and, and generally supporting the Americans on, 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 a, on a flank. Because you've got to remember that the, 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 there were two fleets, well, there was one fleet in the Mediterranean, depending in the Pacific, uh, it was either called the Fifth Fleet if it was commanded by, I think, Admiral Spruance, and it became the Third Fleet if it was commanded by Admiral Halsey. But it consisted, I think, of four or five, I can't remember exactly how many, uh, carrier task groups, and each group had four or five carriers in it. And each group had four or five carriers and three battleships and five cruisers and about 30 destroyers, all arranged in a sort of circle, circles. And the British Pacific Fleet was, was one, of the, one of those and, and on a slightly smaller scale. We only had four carriers and, and two battleships, and, but otherwise, and it operated on the flank, as it were. What kind of uh, nation, uh, naval nation, was Japan? Well, she, she had a, really, I suppose, I don't know, it had quite an effective fleet. Uh, it had enormous ships, and, but by that time, there was really virtually no, I mean, all the major battles had been fought, the, the, the Americans, and they were mostly inter-carrier uh, battles, very few inter-ship battles. And uh, there were a few inter-ship battles, but most of the major uh, Japanese units had actually been sunk by then. So that when the fighting moved up into Japanese home waters, I mean, there was no surface opposition at all. In any case, if they sucked their nose out, they would have had about 600 airplanes over the head of them. So I think they kept their heads down. Did you come across any kamikaze pilots? Yeah, no, pilots. Or kamikaze activity? Oh, yes, we saw quite a lot of that. Yeah. They, um, it was at once, what, what happened was one of the destroyers was always put as what we call plane guard in the middle of this circle. And the carriers on the, on the next circle out, as it were. And the chap in the middle, uh, if, if any airplane crashed or fell overboard, it was, you rushed up and picked up the pilot. But we were, we were in the middle one day, and, and we, we had a, an American liaison officer on board, and um, naval officer. And uh, a kamikaze hit, 
I think it was the, the indefatigable or the implacable, I can't remember which one, right where the island meets the flight deck. And there was a terrific crump and bits went up and smoke all over the place. And the American uh, turned white and said, oh, God, that's, she's gone. And anyway, so we watched this. We weren't very far away. We were watching this through binoculars. The smoke cleared and the bits fell into the sea. And the next thing that happened was that about 20 sailors came out with brooms and swept the rubbish over the side. He couldn't believe his eyes. Of course, what he didn't realize was, at least I, I don't think he realized, that the British carriers had armored flight decks. They had sort of four inches of armor, whereas the American carriers had wooden flight decks. And whenever a kamikaze hit one of those, it went straight through the flight deck and exploded in the hangar. And then, of course, it set fire to the whole bloody thing, and, and there was a frightful shipwreck, sh and they, of course, lost the ship. And he, they were absolutely amazed to discover that, that, that a... a, a um, one of these carriers could be hit by coming to cars in the most vulnerable place, and nothing happened. I mean, there was a lot, it, it burnt a bit of the... Of the, of the uh, and then Illustrious had a most extraordinary experience. I, I, mean, I wasn't on board, but I heard about it afterwards. They had, sticking out in front of the compass platform, you know, where, the, where the, the, the command stood, which sticks out in front of the, the island, they had a big aerial, radar aerial, a sort of cheese thing, you know, about, what, about six foot across and about that deep, and this aerial going round inside. And the kamikaze attacked them, and the tip of its wing went through the, the uh, radar dish in front of them. So you can imagine what it must have been like standing on the bridge, and it Quite crashed terrifying. into the sea beside them. And, 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 and nothing happened to anybody. Quite terrifying. But Bruce Fraser was actually on board an American battleship, I think it was, but just before the, the BPF arrived out there. And <clears throat> he was up on the, on the command uh, platform.
when a kamikaze hit. And he had General Lumsden, Ram Reen, standing next to him, who was killed outright. And several other people were badly wounded on the bridge. And, and Admiral Fraser absolutely didn't have a scratch. <laughs> Most extraordinary. Were, were there feelings of, of envy as uh, Europe celebrated victory over the Germans and looked forward to peace while the job, in fact, in the Pacific still had to be completed? No, 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 certainly not envy. I think um, relief. I mean, we were all delighted that it was over in, in, in Europe. I mean, don't forget that everybody on board had friend, uh, well, families and friends at home. So they were absolutely delighted that it was over. You know, they, they, they didn't have to worry about their wives or parents or girlfriends. Did you take any time to uh, celebrate VE Day? Did you have time? We were at sea. Uh, we were coming south because we'd been running for ooh, the best part of, of, I suppose, living now, where was it? About 12 months. And so we were sent down with, with one other destroyer and Illustrious back to Australia for a, a reef in, in, in Melbourne. And we were there from the uh, I suppose the end of April till when we sailed with the Duke of York on something like the 20, no, end of, uh, when would it have been, end of, yes, end of April, beginning of June, and we left end of July, so we had about six weeks out there. And, uh, there was a certain amount of celebration in Australia, but of course, by the time we arrived there, it was all over. And, and everybody was much more, in that, at that time, much more concerned with the war in the Pacific. You talked about friends and family and this sort of thing. Was Princess uh, Elizabeth able to communicate in her letters uh, the relief that Britain felt? I, in the life of me, can't remember what she wrote in her letters. <laughs> but they were numerous, obviously. No, not particularly. She was quite busy too, don't you? <laughs> yes, exactly. Do you think the veterans of the Far East are given enough credit for, for the way they uh, conducted themselves in wartime? By whom? Or are, are they overshadowed, in fact, by, by uh, European forces? Well, speak for yourself. Well, you say by historians, I really meant. Not well, that I'm a great historian. It depends what history you read. I mean, if you read an, uh, uh, an account of the war in the Far East, they get full credit for what they did. Um, some people obviously were more interested in the in the war in Europe, and some people were interested in the war in the Far East. I think, um, I mean, everybody had their nose to the grindstone in the sense that you, you didn't stand around discussing things um, as if you were attending an editorial conference or something. You you mentioned Australia and the Australians. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, how would you assess the performance of the of the Allied fighting fighting forces? In, in the Pacific? Oh, they, well, they, they, of course, were, had been at it very much longer in the Pacific. I mean, they were fighting in, in Borneo and then the Solomons, and, and both their, their navy, the ships and soldiers, and they had a very, very rough time, and they were fighting under extremely difficult conditions, tropical conditions, jungle conditions, and uh, they acquitted themselves brilliantly. Uh, and the New Zealanders also in, 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 in the Solomons. It, 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 was, it was a very, very difficult war against the Japanese. And, and I, they did extremely well. I mean, there was no, no one ever doubted. And, and there were, of course, several uh, Australian ships were part of the British Pacific Fleet as well. How did the war year shape your character? No idea. <laughs> Who were the major influences on your life during these years? Uh, I suppose, um, that's a very difficult question to answer. The first captain in Wallace was a fellow called Teddy Haywood Lonsdale, who was a, who was a great character, and I, I, became, I was very fond of him. And he had a, um, he'd been in the Navy, and then went out and then came back again. And um, was, a, was, a, was a great, in, I mean, he was a great gentleman and leader, and, and, and I think had a, a very considerable influence over the way people behaved on board. Um, I suppose, um, I mean, the, the, all the sort of people you served with had an influence on you, you know, whether they were the captains, Captain Norfolk, for instance, was a, well, he was a commander then, uh, had an influence, the captain, um, and, then, and then 
friends, other first attempts, because you've got to know, that's how I got to know Mike Parker, but I mean, there were, there were, there were seven or eight of us, all first attempts in the same fratilla, so we got, it was a sort of first attempts club, you know, we all got to know each other, and we all had the same jobs. Of all the ships you sailed in, does one particular one stand out as being your favourite? Well, what do you mean during the war or at all? Yes, during the war. Uh, well, I, had, I suppose I spent longer in Welp than in, in any other, and, and I was first ten second in command in a sense from beginning to end. So, yes, that was probably, and it took me all the way from Scarpa Flow to Tokyo and back again. You, your final job in the war on HMS Welp was to, was to transport prisoners of war. Yes. What sort of condition were they in? Well, we, to get it straight, what we did was, in the days when we were waiting for Marshall to arrive in Tokyo, uh, Bruce Face had organized for the light freight carriers to fly off their aircraft and come into Tokyo to collect prisoners of war, and he got that agreed that they would be evacuated even before the, the surrender. So we spent a few days close in shore, uh, collecting boatloads of, of, they were in fact naval prisoners, and ferried them out to the light fleet carriers, which were quite, because it's an enormous place, Tokyo Bay, which were anchored some way away. Well, that was very emotional, of course, because these people were, were naval officers, naval people, they weren't officers necessarily, they hadn't been in a naval atmosphere for three or four years, or sometimes longer. They were emaciated, and they sat down in the mess. They were suddenly in, a, in an atmosphere which they recognized, you know, they were back in the mess, and the people, our ship's company, recognized that they were also fellow sailors. And so we gave them a cup of tea, but I mean, it was an extraordinary sensation, because they just sat there, and, and both sides, I mean, our own and them, I mean, just tears pouring down their cheeks. I mean, they, they just drank their tea. They, 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 they really couldn't speak. It was the most extraordinary sensation. And it, and it caused the, um, I mean, it affected everybody. And mind you, once that was over, you know, you collected another lot and it was, it was not quite so, it affected quite so much the second time. But we only, we did it, what, for about two days, I suppose. Can you understand the, the feelings of these men nowadays when they still find it impossible to forgive and forget? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I, um, I think that it's, it's, I think it's very silly of people to say that, that these individual people should, should somehow or other rec be reconciled to uh, their captors in any way and their tormentors. I think it's, it's unreasonable. I mean, it, it, it I think there's the, the reconciliation means a lot of other things, but it doesn't mean that each individual has simply, has simply got to forget and pretend that it never happened, or pretend that they that they were desperately affected by the by the experience. I can well understand that. I mean, it's interesting that in, that it, it didn't happen with with the Germans because, in in point of fact, the prisoners were in a sense, reasonably well treated. They were treated, they, they had contact with the Red Cross, they were not exploited, they were not victimized in any way, they weren't tortured, they weren't starved, they, were, they weren't you know, sent to forced labor. They were treated by, as, as prisoners of war under the Geneva Convention. Well, this didn't happen in, in, to, by the Japanese, and I can quite understand why those people, I, as I say, it's unreasonable to expect them to, to, to forget it. <laughs> and pretend somehow it didn't happen. So what would your memories be? Well, I wasn't a prisoner, so it didn't, no. in, in the sense it didn't, uh, I, I can't speak, I mean, I can speak for them in the sense that I can, I can understand to a certain extent what they feel, but it, uh, I don't feel I, uh, reconciliation is a problem as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it's quite funny when we went to the first time, we went to, to Japan on a state visit in the 70s or 60s, I think it was, and, People said, first visit to Tokyo, and I said, yes. <laughs> so what will your memories be on VJ Day? Any, any specific thing? I mean, you were very graphic about those prisoners of war. Well, I mean, that's one thing. And of course, being in Tokyo Bay with the surrender ceremony taking place in a battleship, which was, what, 200 yards away, and you could see what was going on with a pair of binoculars. And, uh, and then they, they, they beat retreat and, and they 
it, it, you, could, you could hear going on on the quarter deck. Uh, they, actually, the beat retreat was in, was in the um, King George V. That was Admiral Rawlings, who was second in command. And uh, that was it. everybody moved over there. I, mean, I wasn't on board, but you could hear it going on. But that, that, and then by that time, of course, a lot of other ships had come in. We were only in there on our own to begin with. Must have been a very impressive sight. Well, it was a great relief. I mean, it was it was that wonderful feeling that, uh, and I remember because from there we went on to to Hong Kong, and the most extraordinary sensation when we sailed, we suddenly realised we didn't have to darken ship anymore. We didn't have to close all the scuttles. We didn't have to turn the lights out. And not only that, we actually stopped in the South China Sea and piped hands to bathe. You know. And it was, Imagine doing that in the, during, in the Mediterranean during the, when, when the heat was on. You couldn't do anything like that. So you suddenly, all these little things built up to, to uh, you suddenly feeling that life was different. and Duke of York, the free, uh, Halsey was in the Missouri, and he had four destroyers and, and there were two of us. So it was this, this little party of six destroyers and two battleships. Went off to, to uh, uh, Japan, and uh, the next day, or whatever it was, we anchored in, the, uh, in a Sagami Bay, which was on, just on the outskirts, and we waited there oh, for 24 hours, and then this party went up into Tokyo Bay. One of the extraordinary things that happened while we were in that bay Waiting. I mean, it was quite quite a dramatic uh, arrival. You know, you've been you've spent years fighting the Japanese, you've read someone, and suddenly we're in Japan. You know, it's most extraordinary. But we heard over the fleet sort of broadcast <clears throat> uh, the two Royal Marines had, had managed to escape, believe it or not, from a prisoner of war camp in Japan. And you wonder what on earth they were doing. I suppose they heard the bombs go off, and they thought, well, this is the time to move. And they got down to, the, to this bay and they saw this fleet of ships with Stars and Stripes and, and, uh, and Union Jacks. So they said, well, these must be friends. So they stripped their clothes off and swam out because they were intercepted by uh, you know, patrol boats and taken on board the flagship and everybody thought this was a great occasion. Anyway, about 30 years later, I was attending uh, uh, the annual conference or the annual reunion of the Far East prisoners of war. <clears throat> 